All right, we're back with uh, another episode of Watch and Listen. We're here at the Weiss Watch Company headquarters in Los Angeles, where all of our Weiss watches are made. That's right. Um, and we're back with some new episodes. So today I'm here with uh, the new co-host, Michael Senderovich. Thank you. Thank you very much for the pr- proper pronunciation of my last name. I do get a lot of different types of pronunciations. You're welcome. Thank and you. And I, 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 I notice uh, the Weiss Watch guard dog is sitting over here eyeing me as well. Yeah. He's not very happy to, to have to sit there quietly while we record episodes right. now that we're uh, working here. But he'll have to deal with it. He is a very, very good dog. As an owner of a small and yappy dog, <laughs> I'm very, very impressed with, with Sir Bennett Weiss. Yeah. Anyway, so we have a a pretty exciting episode for you guys today. We're talking about chronometers and certifications and seals and all kinds of cool things. Now, quick question for you before we even get started. Predominantly the Swiss, right, would be the ones that are talking about these seals and certifications. The Japanese don't really have anything, or do they? Um, Not that I'm aware of off the top of my head. It's mainly a Swiss thing, and it's it's historical. Mm -hmm. Um. It goes back to way back when they were trying to make chronometers for ships, ship chronometers for for navigation and uh, making very accurate timekeeping instruments for navigation purposes. It was was to say, you know, I'm a good watchmaker. I can make something that is accurate enough to meet these standards. And you'd get awards. They had uh, they had awards. So they still do, right? They have timekeeping awards and accuracy awards. Yeah, yeah. Not so much out in the kind of uh, straightforward mainstream world of watch collecting and, and watch enthusiasm, but uh, the the really nerdy and geeky people still yeah. do the whole accuracy thing. But yeah. uh, accuracy is good. I mean, you want a watch that's accurate, so yes, accuracy is very good, um, very important. However, there's other things that go with different uh, different seals and uh, certifications. It's not all about accuracy, right? Well, we'll talk about those, and there there are not many of these certifications and seals. We're actually going to talk primarily about three of them: COSC, uh, actually four technically now. Uh, COSC, yeah, there's a few, and I will touch on some of the right. some of the ones that are less well known. Right. But there's a few that you really should know if you're if you're looking at watches. There's a few you got to know. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start with the 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 oldest one in my opinion. Like not in my opinion, the oldest one. Period. Right. COSC. It's that's where you you have the chronometer rating and the chronometer. Okay. Yeah. So COSC is what I was definitely <laughs> COSC is your biggest certification agency. Right. Uh, is it the oldest though? It is the oldest, isn't it? Um, I don't it's know. It's been around for a very very long time. At least Geneva 100. Seal is very old as well. It is. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, well, Geneva is like historically the the center of watchmaking. Right. Um, which is a little bit false. But that's where Ooh, all the watches. That's where all the watches made their way to be sold. Got it. Um, but we'll get to that when we talk about the Geneva Seal. Let's start with with COSC. Let's do that. Uh, where we're dealing with certified chronometers, right? Um, which Rolex is a big brand that is supporting COSC and certifying almost all of their watches. Mm-hmm. Um, Vintage Rolex, you'll find there are vintage Rolexes that are not COSC certified. Mm-hmm. However, I have one here. Yep. Uh, it is my 5512 Submariner. Mm-hmm. And you can see by the, the four lines of text uh, down at 6 o'clock that it is an officially certified chronometer. Right. And not all of the Submariners at that time were officially certified. The 5513 was not officially third certified, hmm. and it had two lines of text. Uh, little details like that in vintage Rolexes make a huge difference. Right. However... And price, too. Uh, big, big difference in price. <laughs> yep. However, just because this one has those extra lines on the dial that say it's a certified chronometer, it means nothing now. Hmm. It does not mean that this watch would pass, uh, pass chronometer certification today. Right. It most certainly would not pass. Well, this was a question I actually ended up writing down because I know enough about COSC to kind of have a conversation about it, but obviously this is a podcast about watches, and I'm here to learn as well (laughs) and for our audience to learn. So with COSC specifically, suppose that you have a watch, any new modern Rolex, right, and you drop it. 
and you send it back to Rolex, do they recertify it as COSC? Or it's, nope. It's only at the initial kind of portion, right? Only so. initially is a watch certified COSC. And the second it leaves their facility where it's being tested, it is no longer anything special. Their facility as in COSC or as in Rolex? It's a test that takes time. At It's one, one time, one moment in time, this watch is keeping accurate enough time right in these different tests to be certified okay uh when you wear it on your wrist Mm -hmm. it's very different than sitting on a machine sure that is simulating a wrist right uh so as a watchmaker i would hear that often uh you know this watch is certified chronometer and i'm wearing it and it is running slow Mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be running this slow i'm you know it's like two minutes a week well that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the watch you might just not be as physical as they expect you to be. Huh. Uh, so, you know, you need to regulate the watch. Right. Go out and do some exercise. Yeah, or that. Uh, so there's there's plenty of instances where it's not the watch's fault. It's just people wear their watch differently. Sure. And every time you move a watch, the rate changes. Every time you move a watch, the amplitude changes. Uh, and those are the two things that are really going to affect the timekeeping of your watch. Sure. So it's really just in those tests, they were able to pass it, which means that the manufacturer paid very close attention to what they were doing when they manufactured that watch so that it would pass that test. Got it. So the manufacturer is looking at what COSC as an organization is doing and trying to keep up with, keeping up with the Joneses basically is what you're trying to say, or is that Yeah, keeping up, but also... You know, if you need a watch to handle temperature extremes, Mm -hmm. well, when watch components expand or contract based on heat, they can tend to change the rate of the watch. Right. So you need to make sure that your components are really nicely finished and make sure that your tolerances on the machining of the diameter of that pinion are really tight, really tight tolerances. Uh, So you have to start there. You know, you can't just take a watch that is not chronometer Mm -hmm. and try to mess with it and make it chronometer. That's not the best way if you're a manufacturer. Okay. If you're a manufacturer, you want to, you want to start from the beginning of the process of manufacturing so that when you get to the end, a large portion of your watches pass the certification because you've been planning for it from the beginning. Okay. So there's a lot of, uh, different components, even within the same movement, you could have a chronometer version and a non chronometer version. And what that's going to mean is that the non-chronometer version is not going to have the same attention to detail going through the entire manufacturing process. Okay. All right. So let's talk about those details. What are we looking at? You mentioned finishing. Obviously, the more rough the movement, the prob- probably, no, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not the watchmaker here, the less likely it will be as accurate as a finely finished movement. Yes? No? There's a lot of things that that would be one of them, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, you can have a watch with relatively loose tolerances on certain parts, and it will keep fine just time. It will keep time just fine. Just fine. You'll have no problem. Right. Uh, however, you might not be able to pass the chronometer certification 99 times out of 100, mm-hmm. like you want. You don't want to be making movements and watches that are going to fail. Sure. If your whole business plan is on selling certified chronometer watches. So the goal is to keep that level of production very high so that you don't have to throw away watches. Right. Uh, so yes, there, there will be different finishing, there will be different tolerances, uh, and there will be different parts. Uh, you, you might even design parts in a different way, uh, like balance wheels and escape wheels, parts of the escapement that are very essential in timekeeping, they might be fundamentally designed in a different way. You may Mm -hmm. have a different type of overcoil on your hairspring or a different uh, regulating system uh, as far as, you know, pins and different little details. I don't want to get into too much because it won't make any sense, (laughs) but there are different things that they do in the escapement uh, construction-wise that will make for a watch that is more stable in all positions and uh, different temperatures and all the different tests that they're going to put the watch through. Right. So you ask what exactly they are testing for. Um, there's a lot of things. 
let's yeah. pull up the let's pull let's up pull the website, up the, right. the COSC website. Okay, and we let's can kind of go through exactly what it means. All right, let's switch over to that. Okay, here it is, the COSC website. Look at that, eight degrees Celsius, twenty three Celsius, and thirty eight. Thirty eight is pretty hot. Yeah, thirty eight Celsius is pretty hot. So, so these are the parameters. Right, and that's representative of the temperatures, the the three different temperatures they're uh, they're going to be testing the timepiece at. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So now we've got uh, chronometer and chronograph testing. So obviously you have different complications, and you can have let's let's talk about let's say something like a repeater. Is it really does it even make sense to send a repeater over to COSC testing? Um, I don't know. I, I like you could. Uh, I don't know if they have an actual test for it, though. Mm -hmm. So these are the two primary tests, for chronographs and for chronometers. Yeah, and, and the reason they have that is because the chronograph is actually going to drain some of the power mm -hmm. and change the amplitude, which is basically how much power is getting to your escapement. Right. It's going to change that, which could negatively affect your timekeeping if the watch wasn't made very well. Right. Uh, so they have a separate test for chronographs to make sure that your chronograph is still a chronometer when your chronograph is running got it okay all right so the next thing they've got is methods of measurement so uh, let's talk about iso because i think a lot of people don't know what iso means so can you tell us about what iso actually means in relation to COS cosc and watchmaking yes yeah, so it's uh, international standards organization i believe is uh, yeah. is what it stands for mm -hmm. uh, but what they're doing is they essentially compile the requirements for an ISO designation. Mm -hmm. And there is one for, in the watch world, we have one for dive watches, we have one for chronometers. In other worlds, uh, for manufacturers, like manufacturers I deal with, they have an ISO standard for uh, certain types of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a manufacturer that advertises yourself as this type of manufacturer and you're certified 9001, uh, ISO, you know, it means something to those people. To everyone else, it means nothing. Uh, <laughs> but to the people who are looking for that exactly, and they can know, like, I see that that ISO number, I know what that means, and I know I'm going to get exactly what I need to get from it right. because of that. Um, so th that ISO standard is very important because it allows the certifying agencies to then make sure that you achieve that mm -hmm. to begin with. Got it. Uh, and that will have this, those certain standards of timekeeping in order to call your watch an ISO certified uh, or ISO to ISO standard, not certified, but to that ISO standard, uh, certified chronometer or just chronometer. Got it. So I could meet those standards internally for Weiss Watch Company, mm -hmm. and I could put chronometer on the dial of my watches. Okay. I could even put certified chronometer if I chose to certify them myself. My, myself. Um, okay. Wouldn't make total sense for me to send them out to Switzerland and have a an agency in Switzerland test them and then send them back to me and say approved. Sure. Um, but anyone could do that if they wanted to. Okay, so l let's talk about the point of COSC at this point then, because you mentioned kind of earlier that there really isn't much of a point left to doing that. So if you could do it yourself... For example, like Rolex, which is a very vertically integrated company. They have their own foundry, for God's sake. Why would they send their watches out to COSC? Marketing. Okay. It's valuable marketing-wise to have an outside agency mm -hmm. certify your work. Mm -hmm. If Rolex just said, you know, we, we put a stamp on it ourselves and it's very accurate to our accuracy standards of, of XYZ, um, that's great. You know, we, we trust you as a brand and everything. That's that's wonderful. Right. You made a very accurate watch. But then when somebody outside says, yes, you have made a very accurate watch, uh, that third party really helps. And it also makes sure that they keep advancing. Mm -hmm. uh, COSC standards have become more stringent. They haven't always remained the same. Right. As technology advances and uh, as the industry advances so do these agencies and their demands of what a COSC uh, certified chronometer are will change. Right. So for companies like Rolex and Omega and Breitling who make a large majority of their watches with the COSC um, certification, 
it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's a big selling point, and it means that they're still holding themselves to really high standards from when they start making your watch to when they finish it and send it off to COSC, and it's certified by an outside agency. Got it. See, another follow-up question I have is this. Watches, for the most part, right, are made and milled by machines. They're assembled by people, most watches. And we're not talking about something along the lines of VC or Paddock or some, some of the higher-end brands, right? For the most part, you have machines doing the same process and milling the same parts over and over again. Now, I understand there's going to be a certain deviation of quality, right? But you would think, right, if you have a CNC machine, the reason that you're using a CNC machine is for that consistency, right? You would think. You would think. Okay, so <laughs> When explain. you really get down to it, uh, manufacturing anything is extremely complex. Just because you have a CNC machine to make a part does not mean that every part will be the same. Okay. It takes... A CNC machine will not run itself. It will not create your parts. It will not do any of these amazing things that, that most people think it will do. <laughs> CNC requires a brain. And the brain okay. is the person who is operating the CNC. Got the it. real live human. Got it. So it's just a different, uh, a different expert that is required. It used to be an ex an expert that ran a lathe by hand mm -hmm. with uh, micrometer adjustments on cross slides and actually moving cutting tools with little screw cross drives into the part and removing material and measuring uh, and cutting and measuring and cutting and measuring and doing <laughs> it all by hand. That took an expert to make those parts. Sure. Making a part on CNC takes a very different expert. There is none of that going on. There is uh, designing of tools and fixtures. There is designing of parts, making sure that your part is repeatable in such a way uh, that it lends itself to that CNC machine. Selection of tools, selection of, uh, not only selection, but the making of tools. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to make the tools and make the fixtures to hold these little parts uh, in order to do it properly. So there's a lot of behind it and I won't go into crazy detail about this because I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about this but I will say that I was at a machine manufacturer mm -hmm. that makes CNC machines and I witnessed a Patek Philippe machine on their floor being tested interesting and the reason it was being tested it, it was essentially returned Mm -hmm. because they were not getting good results and they were making main plates with this machine. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the machine was located on a second floor. It was not on a solid concrete foundation. Got it. So just the fact that there was a little bit of movement in the building right. changed everything. That's incredible. So even with the experts over there, they had to bring the machine back and figure out what is going on. Right. So just because you have these tools does not mean that you don't need serious brain power and experts running them sure. to still make these very precise, very technical parts. Uh, it's just that it's a little bit different than it used to be. Got it. Um, so I kind of went a little off topic there. That's okay. Let's go but back <laughs> to it. We took, a, so, we took a slight road... <laughs> Uh, well, we, we went off the road slightly. We went, yeah. we went, off, we went off roading. We, uh, we're coming so, back now. Back to where I think you were getting at, which was uh, you know the, the parts and how technology should make these parts more repeatable and more perfect and, and everything. You would think, yeah. It, it is true, but it's still very, very hard and very expensive to achieve that. Okay. Just as it was in olden times when you had a a drive shaft running above everybody's workbenches in the barn and leather <laughs> leather belts coming down to run their hand powered lathes and or even before that when people were using a foot pedal to to spin a wheel sure or doing it by hand like these machines behind us from the 1800s um it still takes an expert yeah well you know you're, you're manufacturing something that is very complex People don't underestimate, well, they do underestimate the complexity of a watch, even like the simplest base movement, like anything from ETA, for example. You're looking at tolerances that are unfathomable to most people. 
Yeah. And if you don't reach those tolerances, you're going to have problems. You're going to have failures. You're going to have deviations from accuracy, so on and so forth. So that's why we're, we're on the to- topic of COSC because we're, we're talking about a level of excellence. And truly, it, it is a marketing, uh, maybe a gimmick at this point, but there is some substance behind it. Yeah, there's definitely substance. It's it's just it's not so much about how accurate your exact watch is. Mm-hmm. It's really everything leading up to the delivery of a very accurate watch. And knowing that that was handled with the greatest amount of precision in order to deliver that COSC certified watch. Right. But your watch that you're wearing even though it had a COSC cert- certificate and went through all of that testing, does not mean that it is going to be as accurate as their tests say. Sure. Because it's different circumstances, and as the watch ages and the oils age and the parts wear, uh, all of these things change that. Sure, it's still a mechanical object, yeah. and that it's going to have some failures. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the 5512 that you have here. So on the bottom here, at the 6, there's your, oh, I'm going backwards here, okay. <laughs> There's your little COSC kind of indicator, right? Yes. All right, when it comes to that indicator, suppose that we have, we're Rolex, and we're, we, we manufacture 500,000 5512s. And we send all of them, and let's say 450,000 are COSC approved, and 50 are not. What happens to those 50? Do we have to scrap them? Do we put the COSC stamp on them and then kind of just go with the flow? What what happens in that instance? You don't have to scrap anything. I mean, I don't know what Rolex's policy was, mm-hmm. uh, whether they have something in place now or back then had something in place. Uh, but it, it just depends on their cost involved, you know? If it is more cost effective to repurpose the watch and take the movement and put it into a watch that is not a COSC certified watch Mm -hmm. then that would be the decision uh if it's more cost effective but it could just be a simple amount of regulation that it takes to correct that so you regulate you can send it back you can try multiple times to achieve a certification yeah oh yeah yeah so one thing that uh you also need to think about when you're dealing with a cosc certificate Mm -hmm. you're gonna have serial numbers on that Mm mm-hmm so that is going to be issued, and you're going to need to have a serial number on your movement and a serial number on your case. Okay. So any deviation from that, which if your watch is old, it's very likely that the movement was replaced at some point. Hmm. It's just like a numbers matching car. Right. Uh, so there will be watches out there that appear to be COS certified, but they're matched with you know the the movement number on your COSC certificate doesn't match the uh, the actual movement that's in the watch. Do you? I've never noticed this, but do you actually get a COSC certificate when you purchase a watch that's yes. new? You, okay, yeah. so you have the certificates in there, the box and papers. That's that's yeah. what's important. Okay, got it. So you, if you really want to pay attention to something like that, you can open up the COSC certificate to see if it matches, and then you'll have your answer basically. Yeah, got it. Interesting. I. I you, when it comes to cars, if it's not numbers matching, the value is substantially reduced. But yeah. you don't see that in watches. You're not going I don't think we watch collectors maybe after this episode will get people to be a little bit more There's a little bit of that with Rolex uh-huh. um just because of the vintage market being as hot as it is right now uh for vintage Rolex, you will see things where uh you don't necessarily know for sure numbers matching unless it it goes back to Rolex. However, you should know general date ranges. Okay. Uh, a lot of the vintage stuff you're not going to have papers for. Sure. You know, so you have to look at the serial number on the movement, look at the serial number on the case, and you can look it up on the internet. There are some good resources in order to kind of date your movement and date your uh, your case. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're learning. We're learning, and this is very good. <laughs> All right, so let's talk more about uh, COSC standards. Yes. So we've got a range of up and down in terms of seconds, and that was actually Rolex has decided to take an extra step. So what's the COSC 
rating? What what where do they require you to be in terms of uh, COSC? I believe, I, and we should pull up the Let's site do because Let's I don't know the, the current uh, exactly what it is, but I believe it's negative three uh, plus six, maybe or or either negative two. So here okay, are so negative four okay. plus six. And they actually have two categories. One is for small watches, like very small watches, and one is for your standard size watches. Uh, so category one is what we're looking at. They're a little more relaxed when you're dealing with a really tiny watch mm -hmm. uh, because they're very hard to make tiny watches as accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, so category one is that negative four to plus six, and that's your daily rate. Um, and it's not so simple as daily rate. That's why we have all these other things. And you also see average daily rate. Right. Daily rate is four seconds up, or I'm sorry, four seconds down, six seconds up. So four seconds slow, six seconds fast. Yes. Okay. Per day. Per day. So that's your average daily rate. And what that means is you're actually taking measurements in multiple positions of the watch because gravity affects your watch differently. So whether it's on its side, dial down, dial up, uh, crown up, crown down, it, there's all these different positions it can be in, and it will have a different rate in all of them, and it will have different amplitude in all of them. So it's essential that you measure that in multiple positions uh, during multiple different tests, even tests where the watch is moving while it is being tested, uh, or in different temperatures. Uh, while it's being tested. So there are some other things in here as well mm -hmm. where you're going to have deviation. You don't want the rate in one position to deviate too far from the rate in another position because that means that something is wrong. That means that some part is a little out of true, uh, and that's why you have that problem. Okay. Uh, you've also got, uh, what else do we have in here? The thermal variation. So that's what we're talking about when you have... The temperature goes up and down with your watch. Mm -hmm. um, shouldn't be a huge factor because you wear your watch on your wrist and it'll stay body temperature pretty much. Right. Yeah, and it looks like it's 0 0.06. Exactly. Or 0 but, 0.6. But if you start to get a little aggressive with it and you want to test it, you know, they have standards. They're not testing it to the point of, like, you know, freezing your arm off in the, uh, in the Arctic or anything like that. Or, sure. uh, like temperatures where you're going to die sure <laughs> they're not testing for that yeah that's they're a, just the least testing of their concerns, you know basically. basically room temperature warm and cold um and they're making sure that there's not too much deviation based on temperature which there shouldn't be with a modern uh with modern alloys that we have in the hairsprings and all of that uh, so you can see the main thing is going to be that negative four plus six seconds a day okay so what's rate resumption rate resumption mm -hmm. it's a, a section r or symbol r the variation what was that the, the variation between the last rate of tests and the average of the first two rates of the tests uh read that again to me the variation between the last rate of the tests and the average of the first two rates of the tests okay so what they're doing is they want yeah so they're testing it, and then they do the same thing again, mm -hmm. and it should be the same result. Okay. Uh, and if it deviates too much, then you have an issue, obviously. Right. You don't want to, uh, I mean, with anything, you want to know what's going to happen when your watch is fully wound and on your wrist. You should know, like, nothing else has changed. Right. You should get the same result. Sure. Uh, so that's that's what that is. It's funny they use different terms than we use as watchmakers. And I was, I was reading through that and I was like, well, this is a weird thing. But uh, as a watchmaker, you're not necessarily testing the same thing twice right. and trying to get the same result. Um, it's not a typical test that, that is run. Um, that's really only in, chronometer certification mm -hmm. where they're really trying to make that watch fail basically yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, that was interesting to me to to see some of these other things and yeah those multiple tests are are kind of odd well let, let's clear this up a little bit so the multiple tests are we talking about let's say monday they receive the watches and they run the test okay so the way it works is they're testing over a period of time okay uh 
did they have their number of days on there? Let's check. I believe check. COSC, um, COSC, I think, is going to be 16 days or something like that. Okay, so they're, the, they're really running these things for a while. So quartz movements we have. So let's see certification. We're on the same page here, certification requirements. They should have the number of days. Let's and see. it's longer than one power reserve, essentially. Okay. So they want the watch to not only run, but also run down to make sure that they are achieving the right power reserve, all of these things. Uh, so the watch will be running, depending on if it's automatic or manual, you can certify both. An automatic watch would be on a winder and uh, like a wrist simulator uh, while they're doing these measurements. And they will have certain measurements that they do at certain times, mm -hmm. and they will repeat those measurements. So if your watch was on the winder today and it started at 8 a.m., they're going to have it on the winder. And they're going to have a set time that they test the rate, and they're going to okay. grab that value uh, right at that time, and then the next day, the watch should still be fully wound because it's on a winder. Mm -hmm. It should still be about the same wind, you know? Uh, so they're going to grab the rate at 8 a.m. Okay. And if that rate is deviating from the previous day's rate, there's something weird going on. Sure. Okay. Uh, that so makes they sense. don't want that deviation. That makes sense. And I don't know exactly how many days the COSC test takes, but I know that the other tests range from about seven days to 16, 17. Uh, they're like a couple of weeks. Got it. All right, fair. So we've got a couple of other watches here that are COSC certified. So if you guys uh, looked as I was scrolling, you uh, would have seen that they actually have a quartz certification too, which is, yes. I, I think it's kind of silly because you would assume that most quartz watches would probably be within the range of COSC. No? So most quartz watches will be within the range of COSC for mechanical watches. Mm -hmm. Look up the COSC quartz standards. Let's do it. All right, so we've got quartz movements. Oh, those so are quartz very different numbers. Standards are going to be much tighter than the mechanical watch standards. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty standard. Right. What are we numbers. at there? Yeah, point zero seven. Average uh, average daytime rate at 23 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so seven-tenths of a second. Right. Plus or minus daily. Yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah. It's a real so big difference. Extremely accurate. And this here, this watch, uh, this Breitling Super Quartz is a certified chronometer. Mm -hmm. You got the little uh, pointer? Yes, I there do. There we go. There it is. Right there on the dial. You've got your little certified chronometer uh, text, and this would have come with a certificate as re as well. Right. Um, yeah, just let you know that it was accurate when it was made and tested. Got it. Now, I've seen watches where it just says chronometer. And that's going to be different. Mm -hmm. So you can make a watch that meets the ISO chronometer standards and label it a chronometer. Okay. That's something that you can do on your own without any outside agency. That's what you were um, talking about earlier, yeah. is doing something with Weiss. So you could yeah. just put chronometer on there, but you can't put officially certified chronometer. Uh, you could if, if you consider yourself official, I guess. Okay. Um, but it, it wouldn't necessarily be the right thing to do, I don't think, unless right. you created an agency that really uh, was truly stringent. Sure, that we're talking about a matter of ethics yeah. at this point. Yeah, so you'll see that a lot of older watches will not have any kind of official chronometer mm -hmm. on them. And I'm talking old, like 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, pocket right. watches, things like that, uh, which they were made to the chronometer standards. Some of them were submitted to the observatory for certification. Okay. Those ones might have an additional observatory certificate or some kind of stamping on the case or movement uh, or dial that mentions the observatory testing that it went through. Uh, but otherwise, yes, chronometer means very accurate watch. And that's it. Just an accurate watch. Okay. 
All right, fair. All right, should we uh, move over to a little bit more on the finer side of things? Yeah, I let's guess. let's take it over to Geneva. Okay, let's do it. Let's do uh, Geneva. Uh, we've got some some treats for you guys. They were sent over to us by Crown and Caliber. We were told to pick out some watches, and we picked out some watches, and that's what they sent over to us. So yeah. the next thing we're going to talk about is the Geneva Seal. So the Geneva Seal, or how do you pronounce it in French? Uh, Poisson de Genève, I, I think. Uh, you know, uh, somebody somebody who speaks French can help us out with the trend, the uh, pronunciation. Sure. Okay. So this is a very special watch. It's a 600G. G stands for gold. It's a Patek. I, Patek, Patek. What's the right way? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, everyone always asks me what the right way is, and I'm like, "Well, you're a watchmaker. You, you I'm you, a you watchmaker, um, and I I really dislike the whole <laughs> like shaming people on the way they pronounce a brand name or something like that, uh, because I find a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, "I saw this really incredible watch. I don't know the brand." Yeah, and the reason they say I don't know the brand they're, they're is because they're embarrassed to, to try and pronounce the the brand name right and it makes my life really hard because then i have to <laughs> i have to be like well did it start with a p did it start with a b did it did it was the symbol a crown you know right. and it 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 really bums me out when people judge so hardcore on the way that someone is pronouncing a brand name yeah that's so that's I, i'd rather just say it and then own it you know patek paddock whatever hey watch and listen fans a quick interruption to tell you about another amazing giveaway by crown and caliber this time they're giving away the iconic rolex submariner 16 610 with an estimated value of over seventy three hundred dollars here's how you enter go to youtube.com forward slash user forward slash crown and caliber the sweepstake video will be under the home tab click read more watch the video for some awesome b-roll on the actual watch and then click the link to enter Follow the instructions on the Crown and Caliber site, and you're good to go. Good luck. Now back to the show. Anyway, so we've got a 600G. G stands for gold. It's one of my favorite references. Uh, it is the Calatrava from Paddock. Uh, it is a beautiful, beautiful small watch at 37 millimeters. Quite a small watch. Uh, but this one has is interesting because this is one on the older side of Paddock. So it has the Geneva seal instead of Paddock's new seal, which we will discuss later. So uh, let's talk about the Geneva seal. You are not looking at uh, accuracy as a benchmark. You're looking at what with the Geneva seal? Well, you are looking at accuracy. Right, but that's not... It would be incorrect not... to say we're not looking at accuracy. Wow, I'm having a hard time talking That's right okay. Now. That's it would, it would be incorrect to say that we're not looking at accuracy um, because there are stringent accuracy tests. Got it. But they're the, not put at the forefront as COSC? Yeah, okay, exactly. COSC is like how many seconds a day right? and at what temperature and, and all of these things. It's very, very, very focused on accuracy. But let's um, let's jump back to COSC actually really quickly. So, for example, with the finishing that we talked about. There are no standards on finishing but for But the COSC. quality of the part is what's important, right? Because the, it doesn't have to have decoration on it. It just needs to be done well and within certain parameters yeah. of size. If you're, if you're a manufacturer like Rolex or Breitling or Omega who are sending hundreds of thousands of watches right. to COSC to certify every year, you have to make sure that you are not sending watches that are going to come back without that certificate. Sure. So they have to really make sure that every watch part is as close to the last one as the next one will be and the next one and the next one. Fair. Um, because there is a lot of automation. Uh, and in order to make a chronometer in the way that in those kinds of volumes, mm -hmm. uh, they really have to do perfect manufacturing. <laughs> Uh, it's almost, it's really kind of unfathomable, uh, to think about it, but yes, it very accurate, but it is n in no way like the Geneva seal sure. where they're talking about if this, if this part is not chamfered in this way, it cannot get the approval. Crazy. Uh, with COSC, that does not matter. You send in anything as long as it, 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 uh, withstands the tests and tells time within their standards. 
you're going to get the certificate. Fair. Okay. Well, let's take a look that is uh, take a look at a watch that is Geneva Seal certified. Is that the right way to say it? Certified, I guess, or just has the Geneva has seal? Has the Geneva seal. Okay. Yeah. So this 600G, it does have the Geneva seal. Let's flip it over and take a look at this beauty of a movement with the micro rotor. It's one of my favorite things about this movement. I yeah. love micro rotors, especially the decoration on the inside of that rotor. It's beautiful. So this is a finely finished watch. It's an expensive watch, and that's why, uh, well, it's one of the reasons as to why it's, 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 it's see, you were talking about not having <laughs> the ability to talk. I'm right there with you. It is expensive for a reason, and one of the reasons is, obviously, it's made out of precious metals, so that'll bring up the price. But the other obvious reason is the amount of time that goes into decorating it. Yeah. So... Tell us more about the Geneva Seal and why this watch deserves to have a Geneva Seal. So if you look at the movement in a watch that has the Geneva Seal, all of these parts come together and make an absolutely beautiful movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason behind that is the Geneva Seal and the company striving to attain the Geneva Seal. Uh, if you pull up the Geneva Seal website, sure. they have on there the standards for the movements. And those standards are, uh, let's see, right over here, craftsmanship. Craftsmanship, okay. So they actually tell the manufacturers certain things. You cannot have machine marks on these parts. Mm -hmm. You cannot make this part this way. Well, it does not. It does not meet the cr criteria. Okay. Um, so one big one is no wire springs. Why is that? Wire springs are ugly. <laughs> okay. They are inexpensive to produce. They are not traditional in any way. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so in a Geneva seal watch, they are not allowed. Uh, if you scroll down, you should be able to see a spring. It will be a long spring with a heel on it. Well, no not spring. on that page. Okay. Okay. Well, the spring needs to be machined from a plate of steel. Okay. Instead of just a wire, imagine a paper clip, a tiny little paper clip that you just bend into a, a spring. Sure. Uh, to do whatever action you need it to do. Okay. That's going to be a lot simpler than taking a plate of steel and cutting it into a long, thin uh, part with a rectangular cross-section right? and polishing and chamfering and straight-graining the top, which are all required for the Geneva seal for that part. So every single part that goes into a watch has a classification that it needs to be decorated a certain way uh, or handled a certain way so that it will be a Geneva seal watch. There's the spring at the top. Right. So we could have just taken a piece of wire and formed it so that it pressed on a part. Uh, but instead, for the Geneva seal, mm -hmm. you need to make this part, which is a long, thin piece of metal, which is very delicate. Sure. And not only do you have to make it, but it is required that you uh, chamfer the edges. Right. Just Polish. Right and, and straight grain the sides, polish the, uh, the sink mm -hmm. in that part uh, for the screw, and the pins that are going to come up through the two holes on the sides mm -hmm. so that that part locates properly on the plate you're putting it on, the top of that part that you see, you might not see it, it could be on the dial side, but if you're looking at it, and you're a watchmaker, you'll see it. It has to be high polished as well. Right. So all of these little details, uh, it leads to a spectacular watch. Not only gorgeous to look at, but amazing for the watchmaker to look at when they're inside there working on it. Okay. And all of these parts are finished perfectly right. to the Geneva Seal standard, mm -hmm. inside and out, whether it's hidden or not. Um, it, it's really traditional watchmaking, and the Geneva Seal helps keep that alive. Right. Um, then they also have their rate standards, which for the Geneva Seal, it's pretty simple. As far as I know, it's just one minute, seven days. 
Okay. As long as the watch is not off by more than a minute in seven days, you're good. Uh, if it's manually manually wound, they'll wind the watch every 24 hours. Okay. Uh, during that test for seven days. Mm -hmm. If it's automatic, the watch will be fully wound, and then it will be put on a simulated wear machine where it's moving around to keep the the movement wound fully, uh, and it will run for seven days. And that equates to about, uh, it's like eight and a half seconds. Okay. A day for it's your rate bad. deviation. Yeah, it's pretty good. So it's very close to COSC. Yeah. But it's not, it's not really what they're about. They want a very accurate watch, but they want it decorated to the highest standards uh, and made in the historical ways. Right, and that's made very clear by the participating brands of yeah. the Geneva Seal. So uh, Paddock used to participate. Now they've left and they have their own seal, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but you're talking about brands. Actually, you know what? Let's take a look at the second watch that Crown & Caliber sent over to us, which is a... Um, Patrimony, the Patrimony Calendario. And so right now, current day Vacheron, uh, I believe they're sort of, they're uh, getting the Geneva seal on every watch. Okay. That is uh, a big push for them. Uh, oh, another big thing about the Geneva seal that we completely forgot to mention. Your watch needs to be made in Geneva. <laughs> yeah, so that actually was a question that I was going to ask you. So if, you, if you're not located in Geneva, you can't be participating in the Geneva SEAL program. You have to go elsewhere then, right? Yeah, So, it, and it's the, the canton of Geneva. Right. So, n like the county, mm -hmm. not necessarily in the, the city, city, right? but in the county of uh, canton of Geneva, uh, the watch needs to be made. It does not necessarily mean that all of your parts and everything have to be made there. Okay. But the watch has to be made there. Right. The assembly, know. the final assembly. Yeah, the final assembly and the decoration is supposed to take place there as well. Right, makes sense. Yeah. Because it's primarily focused on decoration anyway, so. Exactly. And, of course, your final testing. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting thing about, actually, there's so many interesting things about the Geneva Seal, but uh, something different about Geneva Seal is that you actually go through the certification process before you make the watch. Okay. That's when it starts. It's kind of backwards. You submit your plans for the watch. You submit 2D oh, drawings. Okay. Because they're looking at how your parts are designed. They want to say, no, we don't like that. That's not, uh, that's not pretty. Hmm. Or that's not historically correct. We don't, we don't really like the way that this, uh, this part is. It needs to be this style of fastener. It cannot be this style to meet the Geneva seal requirements. Um, so they go through your 2D drawings for all the parts and your decoration uh, specifications. They go through all of this, and you'll get, like, the pre-approval. Okay. So then you can make your parts. You make your parts. You give them a kit of parts. Okay. They'll look at all of your parts. They make sure they actually <laughs> are to the drawings that they've already approved. Um, make sure everything's beautifully decorated the way it's supposed to be. And then you will start to actually make your movements and make your watches and they'll test them for the accuracy. But then after you're actually producing your watches and selling them to the public, mm -hmm. they've got the Geneva stamp. You're putting that stamp on in your own factory. Okay. At your own workshop. Got it. So Vacheron is stamping their watches with the Geneva seal uh, and they are monitoring themselves mm -hmm. to make sure everything they're producing is up to the standards of the first one they did. Do you have random quality control? Let's say... You know, there's the possibility There of is it. the possibility. There's so the possibility like a, like of Like an it. audit, basically. I, I don't know how often that happens. Sure. Um, it's more of an honor system. Okay. You know? Very trustworthy. Yeah. And for a company <laughs> like, like Vacheron, these companies are old companies. Yeah. The last thing you would want to do is to um, decrease the value. Sure of that Geneva seal right. by taking shortcuts. Yeah. It would it would not be a good look. It would not be good for the Geneva seal. And if you're putting the Geneva seal on your watches, you want the Geneva seal to be something valuable. Right. And you're already going through the process of getting it kind of authorized, for lack of a better term. Yeah. So why, you, you, will, you already have your systems and processes in place. Why deviate? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's a huge difference. Right. 
between COSC as well. So let's take a look at the movement on this Vacheron to see, again, a watch that is given the honor of having the Geneva seal. So obviously incredibly decorated. Yeah. And yeah, it is very aesthetically pleasing. It's very, very aesthetically pleasing. Right. I find that anything with the Geneva seal, I look at the movement and it is just, they're some of the most gorgeous movements. Right. They're very vibrant. Yeah. They have a lot of, um, there's there's a lot of play with the light. Yeah. So with this particular watch, the funny thing is, is we both sat here and we were both trying to find the Geneva seal. We knew it's there, but it was very difficult to find it because the Geneva seal is so tiny. Yeah. Well, it's not a huge stamp. Uh, it'll look like a shield right. on the back of the the back of the watch. And it especially might. with the automatic uh, movement like this, you're looking you're trying to look past the the oscillating weight, you know, to find that on a bridge. So it's it's there somewhere. Uh so on this one, we'll post better pictures of it. I think it's on the right. It's right on yeah, your balance. On yeah, the balance right. cock right here? There it is. I don't know if you can see that. You but can kind of right see it. There's there like a little indentation there. It's a tiny little stamp Right. that is the Geneva seal. It's actually better visible on the paddock, so we can take a look on the paddock as well. Yeah. So on your paddock, it is right here. Yeah, very, very small, which you would think, you know, if it's such an honor to have that seal, you would kind of put it big <laughs> and, and right there, like in, in the center to kind of show it off and say, hey, listen. Like, for example, with the COSC stuff, it's right on the dial. It says it's a certified... It's a it's a humble brag. Right, exactly, <laughs> right. Okay, all right, so we've got the Geneva Seals. Um, we've talked about that. Is, is there anything else that you want to mention about the qualification of the Geneva Seal? So on the Geneva Seal, because of all the tradition that goes into it, mm -hmm. this is going to be a perfect segue, and you'll see in a minute, uh, to go over to the, the PP certification mm -hmm. that uh that Patek has has now adopted um you have these historical requirements of parts being made a certain way and decorated a certain way and things being done a certain way mm -hmm. uh and they wanted to deviate a little bit <laughs> they also had some ideas as far as the timing and tests and things like that, different requirements that they wanted to impose upon themselves. Okay. Uh, to set themselves apart from other Geneva seal watches. So they actually stopped using the Geneva seal mm -hmm. and switched over to this PP, uh, Patek Philippe seal. Right. Yeah. Let's go ahead and show it actually here. So Which, there it is. There's the seal. Essentially they're, they're kind of like, Meeting pretty much all of the great stuff of the Geneva seal, but then going a little further. And they're also eliminating some of the things that they felt would hold back the Geneva seal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that has to do with their move into silicon parts. Ah, okay. So they're moving a little, they, they moved a little away from all traditional watchmaking. Right. When they went into doing some silicon air springs and, and silicon parts. So it doesn't really fit with the Geneva seal. Sure. Whereas the Geneva seal is very historical and it's not about trying to find new materials and things like that. So it's traditional. Sure. Yeah. So now they have their own certificate and what is the accuracy on that? I, I think it's pretty stringent. I think it's like minus two plus three or something. Could be. Uh, I think it's see. tighter than, than COSC standards. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Minus three plus two. Yeah, so Pretty very incredible. tight. You've got five seconds of deviation possible uh, for your average deviation on the rate. Um, so yes, their timing is more stringent than the Geneva Seal watches. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So it, it was just, you know, it worked for them. And because they're a large company, sure. Uh, I believe... They're probably making around 80,000 watches a year now. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a lot. That's it's a, a lot of watches. A lot of watches, especially with the type of stringency that they have imposed yeah. on themselves. And the amount of decoration that goes yeah. into each and every one of their watches. Right, right. So they've really optimized their, uh, their systems to be able to achieve that. And that is why they have their own stamp. All right. Okay. 
Well, this paddock doesn't, but this, this the yeah, reason this paddock it does not. Right. Um, <clears> if you're looking at paddocks after like 2000, uh, I believe they did the changeover in 2009, but that doesn't mean that every movement that right. had ever been made that was going to go into a watch was already sold. Um, so at about 2009, 2010, you start seeing the, the PP stamp instead of the Geneva seal. And then as time goes on, you're not going to have any uh, Geneva seal movements in your uh, Patek Philippe watches. So let, let's take a, a watch, for example, from Patek. Give me an example. Maybe you can give me a reference or, or a watch that doesn't have a Patek base. Because Patek uses a lot of different bases. They have JLC bases. They have, uh, I think they have Frederic Piguet. No, maybe. They might. Uh, yeah, yeah. They um, they don't use oh, not uh, not every single movement from Paddock is an in-house movement. So you're talking about submitting those plans. How does that work? Can they still um, get a stamp on that? On you're talking bases? about the Geneva seal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so those parts are made for them. Mm-hmm. So what happens is, and uh, Vacheron is a great example of this because this is what they currently do. Okay. Um, their parts are not made in Geneva. Mm-hmm. They do not make watch parts in Geneva. They have a workshop in the Valley de Joux. Okay. Where they are making the watch parts. Right. Uh, a lot of the parts are made at JLC. Okay. And even and that doesn't mean that they go into a JLC movement. That could be parts that are made specifically for Vacheron. Vacheron sends them a drawing file of this part they want. JLC makes them that part, sends them that part. Okay. Uh, And JLC does not know what the movement is, does not know what anything, they don't know what watch it goes in, they know nothing. Really? Just this part. Got it. That's it. it. Okay. Um, And then there are other cases where it's JLC's movement. JLC designed the movement, owns the, the, the documentation and all the tooling, and Vacheron goes to them and says, we are going to make X number of watches with this movement, and this is what we're trying to do. This is the decoration. These are the things we want to change. These are the things we don't want to change. Uh, Essentially customizing it for themselves. Got it. Then those parts would make their way to Geneva unfinished. They would then be finished in the Vacheron workshop by all of the finishing uh, technicians there. Um, And in fact... The Roger Dubois school Mm -hmm. was in their workshop as well in the finishing department area. Okay. Um, But that's a whole other story. Roger Dubois also does uh, the Geneva seal. Mm -hmm. Uh, So back to Vacheron, those parts would make their way over. They'd be decorated in that workshop and finished and assembled, tested. And they would already be Geneva approved, essentially Geneva seal approved. Okay. Uh, the Geneva seal would have been stamped on those parts back in Valley de Joux Got it. at the JLC factory. Got it. Okay. Um, so JLC would have taken care of the 2D documentation for that. Got it. So it's not super, super strict to the point where everything literally, it's not, yeah, we, we get it now. Yeah. I get it now. However, so you might, have, you might have the the Geneva seal version of it and the non-Geneva seal version of it. Sure. Uh, you know, the movement that is being made for Audemars Piguet mm-hmm. that is the same as the movement that is going to Vacheron. Right. Okay, Vacheron's going to have the Geneva seal version. Got it. Audemars Piguet is not going to have the Geneva seal version. Why would they even want that? Right. They're, I mean, all their branding, Le Brasseau, they do not care about Geneva. It's sure. not in their blood and in their heritage. Right. Uh, just like for Weiss. There's no way I'm sending watches to Switzerland <laughs> to have them certified or get a stamp. Absolutely not. Right. A certifying agency in the U.S., I would love to. But there's, you know, it's just, it's not in our uh, brand DNA. Fair. So you'll have instances where a movement could be changed in mm-hmm. such a way where it might have had a non-Geneva seal uh, version, and then they make those edits, they change the springs, they alter it, they re-engineer certain things, and you will get a better movement. Fair. Uh, better is not the right word, but... Well, better in certain movement. regards, yeah. right? Yeah. Not necessarily holistically better, but I mean, yeah. it kind of is, though. It kind of is, because of the standards, both of the timekeeping and the decoration. I mean, you are getting a better product. That's the whole point of it. Yeah. 
but it's not to say that someone in Labrasu can't sure. do all of these historical decorations sure. and all of these things the same exact way and have a good rate and all of this. Uh, it's just not being done in Geneva. Fair, but you <laughs> can look at brands, let's say, for example, smaller brands, uh, like F.P. Jorn, for example. Yeah. The Jorn movements, the decoration on them, are, I think, on par with Geneva Seal brands. Uh, well, yeah, Geneva Seal brands. So it's it's not as black and white as yeah. as we kind of started off with. So uh, we we're, we're running pretty close to the time where we need to cut the episode. So I think we should look at the last kind of player here. This is a newcomer. It's called FQF, and it's a F- Fleurier. Is that is that how you pronounce it correctly? Fleurier. Fleurier. Okay. So let's go to Fleurier. Participate, participating brand. So it looks like this is a similar qualification to uh, the Geneva Seal, but with less history. And you've got, well, it looks like four brands Chopard. The LUC uh, brand, or the, with the subdivision, I guess, of Chopard, it, it actually, they have some uh, stamping on the actual dial. And it looks like the stamp itself is much larger than the Geneva Seal. So it looks like they're trying to prove something, <laughs> uh, which is interesting. But uh, you could, if you if you guys want to, and here's the website, Fleurier-Quality.com. Uh, these are the participating brands, Parmigiani. Uh, Vaucher, is that, uh, That's I guess I'm assuming that's probably close to the pronunciation. That's, you Vaucher. said that was a Vaucher. Okay, that's a movement company. Yes, so they produce movements for, for other brands, mm-hmm. um, and you could get, the uh, the Florier Quality Foundation, I guess, stamp on there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like it's just kind of an offshoot of Geneva. And, and again, uh, quality yeah. control plus marketing, it makes it a little bit more special. Because yeah, if and that's, that's a big thing with the Geneva seal is you have to be finishing your watches in Geneva. Right. And there's not that many brands that are still doing that. Sure. So it's a big differentiating factor. Right. Okay. All right. Is there anything else that we want to talk about when it comes to seals and certifications? Um, gosh, I mean, that those are the big ones, I think. Right. It's really going to be COSC and Geneva Seal. And then you've got Paddock, you know, running their own thing. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Fair. With that being said, I guess this is the time for us to wrap up the episode. Then. Yes. Okay, cool. So, Cameron, let people know where they can find you. Yep, find me uh, on Instagram, Weiss Watch Company, or Cameron M. Weiss. And also hop on our website and buy an ultralight watch. They are very limited, selling out quickly, so get your name on the list. Yeah, and they're very ultralight. Trust me, I've played with it. It is very, very, very light. Right? Yeah, no emphasis on the ultra. (laughs) And with me, very simple, just uh, look me up on Instagram. I've got my email there as well. There's a link if you guys want to talk to me, send me a DM, any questions, concerns. Uh, Road Stories Mike, at Road Stories Mike. And I guess that that's it. We're wrapping it up. A special thank you to Crown & Caliber for sponsoring the episodes. Uh, go to crownandcaliber.com to look at many, many different watches that have the Geneva seal on them. Uh, you can look at these uh, these two buttes right here. Well, they, they'll be sent back to Crown & Caliber after we take some pictures with them and, and have some fun with them. And uh, you can purchase them there. Yeah. So, yeah, um, we're good to go, right? Yep. Okay. All Thanks, right. everyone, See you for next listening. time. Yeah, cheers. <laughs>